All right, is everyone in there? Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's 12 o'clock and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on continuous manufacturing. My name is Megan Bailey. I'm part of ISPE Boston's Educational Programs Committee and I, along with Aaron Hubble, will be your meeting managers for today's program. Before we get started, I'm just gonna go through a few housekeeping items. First off, I'd like to thank our program sponsors, DPS, ICQ Consultants, and Massey Bioservices. Next, some information on how to participate in today's event. All attendees are automatically muted, so you may send your questions at any time during the presentation to the Zoom chat feature. We'll be collecting these questions and address them at the end of the presentation. On behalf of the EPC, I'd like to invite you to also get involved with our educational chapter and volunteer with us. We meet the first Wednesday of every month at 5.30 over Zoom and discuss and plan out topics and speakers for our monthly educational webinars. We'd love to have some fresh perspectives and speakers and industry experts. It's a great way to expand your network. We hope you consider joining. Also, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind you that there will be two ways to share your feedback on the webinar with the EPC today. As we wrap up in today's webinar, you'll see a Zoom poll appear at your screen asking to rate your experience. We'll also e email you a very short survey after the webinar. It's two questions and the feedback helps. Um, so please take a moment to complete it. Lastly, we hope you'll continue the conversation on the chapter's social media platforms. They are listed out below. And I would like to thank and introduce our speakers today. We have Stephen Bourne. He's the Director of Scientific Affairs at Continuous Pharmaceuticals. He's responsible for identifying, innovating, and implementing new unit operations for the integrated continuous manufacturing of small molecule pharmaceuticals. In this role, he manages technical capability strategy by focusing on breakthrough innovation in the industry, collaborating with external partners, and proactively driving internal development programs. In addition, he also works with the FDA's Emerging Technology Team and US Pharmacopeia providing transparency and understanding in the development and regulatory acceptance of novel, novel manufacturing technologies. Tom Ranzahoff is currently the technical head of biologicals franchise at Res Resilience and has over 30 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry. His areas of expertise include development of scale up of biopharmaceutical processes, separation and purification technologies. CGMP manufacturing, and management of technology-based startup ventures. Before joining Resilience, Tom was a managing director at BDO and its precursor, BPTC, a leading CMC consulting firm that he helped build over a 20-year period. Prior to that, he held senior level positions at Transenogen, Diax, Replogen, and Soma. He's also the co-founder of several successful startups, including Fourth Dimensional Bioprocess, Tarpon Biosystems, Bio and BioFlash Partners. He serves on a number of scientific and professional advisory boards and holds a bachelor's degree from MIT and a master's degree from University of California in Berkeley, both in chemical engineering. <laughs> and with that, please join me and welcome today's speakers. Stephen, we'll pass it off to you and you can begin your presentation. Thank you. All right. Are you able to see my slides okay? All right. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, again, this is a talk that um, I presented at the annual meeting. Um, and the topic of my talk is the on-demand manufacturing of small molecule pharmaceuticals. Uh, my name is Stephen Bourne, and um, I work at Continuous Pharmaceuticals. We're a small pharmaceutical company located up 93 in Woburn, and um, we've been around for about eight, nine years. And, um, and I will be discussing some of our experiences uh, with the integrative continuous manufacturing of small molecule pharmaceuticals. So um, this is a slide that I stole from the FDA, and I think this frames kind of what everybody in pharmaceutical manufacturing would like to achieve, which is in line with the FDA's vision for pharmaceutical quality for the 21st century, uh, namely an agile, flexible pharmaceutical manufacturing sector that reliably produces high-quality drugs 
without extensive regulatory oversight. They are spread thin. And so anything that we can do to improve product quality, uh, they would be very happy and are big supporters of that. And um, in line with that, they're big advocates for continuous manufacturing. Um, it's significantly um, improved quality and reduced costs uh, and reduced lead times in just about every other major industry in the world. Uh, however, the pharmaceutical industry being highly regulated and very conservative has been slow to change. And so they would like to see the benefits of continuous manufacturing um, happen for the pharmaceutical industry. So um, when I talk about continuous manufacturing, um, a lot of people talk about it in different ways. And, and here's a nice chart that depicts your risk versus reward over how much you actually uh, connect continuously together. So from point A, uh, from an individual continuous unit operation, like a continuous reactor, or think of a tableting machine, that's already continuous. There's a lot of benefit of, of that um, and, and significantly uh, lower risk. But the more that you start to integrate these unit operations together to get to point B, uh, where you're say integrating all of drug substance, um, manufacturing together or integrating all of drug product manufacturing together, there are definitely benefits, a lot more rewards for that, but there's also more risk. A uh, couple companies that do this great, Eli Lilly does continuous drug substance manufacturing really well, and Vertex does drug product manufacturing very well as well, just on the small molecule side. And then there's point C, which is this idealized goal, if we could just integrate everything from end to end, uh, making the drug substance and drug product and just dramatically reducing the lead time and ensuring everything is under plant-wide control with increased quality, that much more reward there. But again, there's also more risk and, and perceived regulatory hurdles that one has to you know, kind of think about. So um, what I'll be talking about today is point C. So with that, what do I envision this point C being? I call it integrative continuous manufacturing where everything is integrated together. And you can think of it as a seamless line where you're adding chemicals in, your raw materials, and over the course of the process, you produce your API. Uh, in a perfect world, you have all the sensors that you need in order to measure the critical quality attributes of that API. So there's no need to hold it for some indeterminate period of time. Um, you know, aging API in a powder form doesn't really do anything for it. But instead, in C2, you can propagate that on to your downstream process to produce whatever formulation and drug product you want. It could be tablets, could be sterile injectable solutions in a vial, could be an inhaler, whatever. So in order to achieve this, it all has to operate continuously. Uh, you need to have end-to-end -end integration. Uh, it's helpful to have a systems approach. You want to optimize, you know, uh, say your chemistry. You want to think about like, you know, maybe streamlining the amount of solvents you use. You don't want to shoehorn in something so specific that it doesn't integrate well with everything else. So it's to take a systems approach. Um, also very important is to add an integrated control strategy with plant-wide control. Uh, just, there's just so many moving parts. And if you have closed loop control to keep things nice and steady, it's important to have that be automated. So um, this first example that I'm going to discuss uh, just uh, for uh, on the API side, it's a small molecule generic drug that uh, we worked on here at Continuous. Uh, it was one reaction to make this drug and it was literally A plus B as you see. The reaction was run in DMF. It was run at close to reflux temperature, which is around 135 to 150 degrees C. And this is a long reaction, it took about 10 to 14 hours. Now, when people think about flow chemistry, they usually like to have everything run in solution and run in a pipe. But this chemistry was very representative of at least generic pharmaceutical industry in that um, it was as concentrated as you can get it to reduce your solvent costs. Um, it was um, a reactive crystallization, which means that the product C crystallizes out um, as the reaction goes forward. Um, it's a highly exothermic reaction and the crystallization is very exothermic. So we're talking, it's a thick slurry. It's a thick corrosive slurry. Um, and this is not something that usually um, flows that well. Um, also just for frame of reference, it's a high volume generic. So um, our task was to plan for, um, you know, a 10,000 metric ton a year of API uh, manufacturing plant. And so that's just a big scale. This is one of the top five drugs produced in human history and it's not aspirin, it's not, ibuprofen, it's not acetaminophen, it's one of the other two. It's, in, it's just a lot. I think the global consumption is anywhere between 60 and 75,000 metric tons a year. So, you know, this is, you know, big scale. Um, so moving forward, um, we 
developed the chemistry and we landed a pilot plant at our facility here in Woburn. And because everything is continuous and we have 24 hours of, of processing time, or everything's filled, we can run things much smaller and have this really large throughput. So here, this is the, the uh, footprint or the floor plan for our ICM pilot plant. Um, it's a series of enclosures that we landed different unit operations um, of this process. And I'll briefly touch on drug product as well. Uh, for reference, there's this uh, kind of beige box next to this black sink right here. So just for scale, uh, these were two six foot fume hoods back to back. And as you can see from the scaling here, it's about nine meters on a side versus uh, five out or four and a half meters on a side. So again, this is fairly small. It's the size of a kind of a, this is a shipping container. And so the way that this would work is um, the raw materials A and B, we would dump into these back down stations where they were pneumatically conveyed into this dissolution enclosure. The pre-reaction solution was filtered and went into a reactive crystallization enclosure, which then fed material into a continuous filtration system, which then fed material into a continuous dryer, which then fed dry API in spec to our EMC system. And I'll go into more detail. But EMC stands for extrusion, molding, and coating, where we were producing tablets. We also had some space left over, and since every cost for any generic drug matters, we uh, recycled and repurified our solvents. And all of this was done in a uh, plant-wide control operator station was at the bottom. And, um, and yeah, so moving forward, um, here's the process flow diagram, which uh, also describes where we landed PAT, process analytical technology. So uh, again, we have our raw materials coming in. Um, and uh, they fed into a dissolution vessel. And uh, one of the raw materials had some ash in it. So we needed to filter that out because otherwise we wouldn't be able to uh, purify that from our API. So we developed a continuous polish filtration. Uh, then this went into a series of CSTRs uh, to undergo the reactive crystallization. In the last vessel, we landed a mid-IR probe and a uh, FBRM uh, Lasentech probe to analyze the particle size and just to get an idea of reaction conversion. Uh, this material was continuously pumped onto our continuous filter where we uh, removed the uh, filtrate. The wet cake then was resuspended in a resuspension vessel where we also had landed another mid-IR probe. Uh, we used this probe to measure the purity of our API. Um, the resulting resuspended material was uh, wet milled and then dried continuously. And then this dried material uh, would then get separated in a cyclonic separator in an airlock where we were able to measure the residual solvent content by NIR, confirm the crystal form by Raman, and also measure particle size by laser diffraction in line. This dry inspect API was then fed, um, co-fed into a hopper um, of a grab of a hot melt extrusion uh, system where we were also co-feeding in uh, excipients. Um, the excipients were melted, but we maintained the temperature to maintain the stability of the, uh, the crystallinity of the API. And, uh, and then this was injection molded into tablets. Uh, prior to injection molding, we had an NIR and a Raman flow cell to measure content uniformity of the uh, blended mixture and also Raman to confirm that the API was still crystalline before we tableted it. So this is what it looks like on the front edge of the system for the pilot plant. So again, this is a bag dump station up in front and you can see the continuously stirred tank reactors, the CSTR cascade um, in this front enclosure here. The heat exchangers are in the back. And, um, and moving forward, this is just uh, various parts of it from the beginning to the end. So for feeding and dissolution of raw materials, we would get the raw material in uh, 50 pound bags. These would be fed in, pneumatically conveyed to pneumatic receivers which would then drop on call into gravimetric feeders that fed the correct stoichiometry to a dissolution vessel. We were also feeding in the solvent DMF. Uh, even at 78%, everything managed to go in a solution at 80 degrees C, which was absurd. And uh, we were able to continuously polish filter uh, the resulting solution. So uh, just monitoring the pressure differential across of the filter element. And um, as the pressure went up, as you start to collect more and more of this ash or these insoluble impurities uh, at a certain cutoff threshold, it would automatically transfer that feed to this uh, cleaned uh, filter element. And then while that one is then flowing through that filter element, the first one is backwashed in place automatically and then prepped, primed automatically. So that way, when that pressure limit gets hit in the second one, maybe a day and a half or so later, uh, it can automatically swap back to the first one. So this was just a 
a uh, parallel way that we were able to continuously polish filter the pre-reaction mixture. Subsequently, it underwent crystallization or reaction and crystallization. Uh, these slides are really pretty of silica and water. In reality, at 70 weight percent, this is a, a thick, hot, corrosive milkshake looking mixture, uh, which did not look this pretty. But, um, but essentially, we uh, pump material from one vessel to the next, subsequently down the chain. And we have a mid IR and FBR in the fifth stage for us to be able to monitor the process as it runs. Again, for that last part, we had no um, before or for back and forth. Nice to know, not need to know. Uh, for the continuous filter, uh, the continuous filtration, this is a, a unit operation that we um, uh, invented and have IP on. Uh, nothing even fancier than vacuum filtration. Um, uh, we have a porous metal plate here. We pump the slurry continuously onto a plate. We have a mechanism that um, allows the slurry to, call, uh, to cover the radii of the plate as the plate rotates clockwise. This gives us good, uh, you know, uh, nice even slurry on the plate. Um, as the plate rotates, we pull the mother liquor through via vacuum. And then we have these wash blocks underneath each radii that wash the wet cake and purge the impurities from that mother liquor and from the wet cake. When it gets to the other side, through the combined action of a scraper blade and an auger, we're able to remove that wet cake from the middle and resuspend it in this resuspension vessel down here. Now, one reality about filters and membranes is that they always foul, and this is no different. So after we've removed material from the plate, as the plate's rotating, we have an extra radii or two where we can actually wash the plates with solvent to clean the plate. So that way the incoming slurry always sees fresh, clean plate. And we can run this filter for weeks at a time, which is great. Um, this material is resuspended. Here's just a mid-IR probe that helps us measure the purity of the uh, resulting uh, resuspended white cake. And then this gets uh, pumped to the next unit operation, which is our drum dryer. This is another uh, unit op that we've um, uh, submitted IP for and um, or have IP on. And so it, it's two drums that co-rotate inward. We can heat the drums and we can put the chamber under vacuum. So this creates a thin film of slurry on the underside of the drums and the solvent evaporates very quickly. The residence times through our filter and our dryer are about a minute each. And so um, again, um, the API immediately evaporates. Um, sticks to the drums. We have scraper blades on the side, which scrapes the material down. It flies through into a um, cyclonic separator, which separates the vapor from the powder, and into this airlock, which helps us maintain the vacuum pressure of this um, and the operational stability of this uh, dryer. Uh, here is another opportunity to um, measure the critical quality attributes of the API. So again, we have um, a port here to measure uh, the residual solvent content by NMR. We uh, have a Raman probe to confirm the crystal form of what we're producing. And also um, after this airlock, it drops into a search hopper and gets pneumatically conveyed to the next enclosure. And along the way there, it goes through a Malvern um, uh, laser diffraction particle size analyzer. Uh, so that way we can measure all of the critical quality attributes of this API. Um, and then it, it goes to the next enclosure. Again, at any point where we have, uh, we're measuring a critical quality attribute, if something starts to trend away from where you want it to be, it's also important to land uh, diversion points where you can divert the material to a whole tank or a kill tank. So you can then um, address whatever the issue is that is causing your material to go off spec. But in general, you know, you want to do your development before you integrate everything together, but it's good to have these uh, fail safes in place, just in case. Um, again, for extrusion molding and coating here, um, this is what the system looks like. We've got a couple gravimetric feeders uh, in this top right hand picture. You can see uh, one of these gravimetric feeders is feeding an API into this hopper of the extruder. The other gravimetric feeder is feeding an excipient blend into this extruder. And the twin screw extruder does what a twin screw extruder does. It's a blending uh, system where it will heat and melt, uh, in our case, the formulation, uh, which uh, particularly the excipient that we run at a temperature where we don't melt the API and we're able to injection mold tablets. And here's just a picture representation using our company colors with some pretty tablets. And this just injection molds and stamps out tablets. Works really well. And um, so at this point, I'm going to pivot a little bit. Um, so um, beginning of this year, we won a large contract from the US government for some capabilities uh, to produce uh, small molecule uh, drugs. Um, particularly with very rapid um, kind of lead times. Uh, again, capacity planning in the event of a pandemic or an emergency crisis, it's kind of the life we live these days. So here's a, a 
a picture of what we call our ICM factory. Uh, it's a concept drawing and also our, our BOD site plan. So um, this manufacturing facility is also here in Woburn. Uh, this first building is built as a worm shell currently. Um, in the back is a utility building that we haven't started building out yet. Um, and then this uh, BOD site plan pic is just a, a picture from the back where you can see some solvent tanks and everything. So in this facility, we're gonna have a couple different suites uh, for being able to produce continuously API. Also, we are building in the capability to produce not just solid oral justice form, but also uh, sterile injectable solutions and a vial filling line. Um, and it'll be a, a high speed filling line um, just so we can meaningfully respond to any kind of future pandemics or, or, or drug needs. Um, but yeah, there's a lot going on in this building. Again, uh, sterile solutions as well as solid oral doses and APIs, there's just a lot going on. Um, in this facility right now that we have queued up, we have uh, three APIs that will be integrated with uh, the synthesis of these, will be integrated with uh, formulation, fill, and finish. Um, and some of the flow chemistries also include acylation and alkylation, ring in formation and use, condensation. We're doing an asymmetric hydrogenation. Uh, there'll be a reductive amination as well as a dynamic kinetic resolution. So just from looking at these, there's a lot of varied chemistry that we're going to be doing in this facility. And so we're building in the infrastructure to be able to handle all of that. Um, in addition, um, of these three drugs, two of them are highly potent, and one of them is a controlled substance, which makes things um, all the more interesting. Uh, so we are upgrading our filter and dryer systems to be able to deal with highly potent compounds. Um, so that uh, means that we need to build in a lot of clean and place capability and containment for how we uh, run, operate, and clean these. And so again, these are just some prettier versions of what you've kind of seen before, our rotary filter, our drum dryer, and then the drum dryer isolator here where we'll be running this process. Um, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention is that for that pilot plant that you saw, for that you know filter size, which was a nine inch diameter plate and those drums that you saw, the nominal throughput through that facility, through that pilot plant is 1.5 kilo of API per hour. So that's a pretty good clip for such a small system. And so we're going to be looking to operate at a similar throughput for our manufacturing facility. But again, it's, uh, you know, these unit ops can take a, a wide range of throughput. So it'll be able to run at low throughput of, you know, hundreds of grams an hour up to kilos per hour if we need to. Um, so just to summarize, um, the end-to-end -end ICM, and the Integrated Continuous Manufacturing, uh, we accomplished at the R&D pilot level. And we're currently building out uh, a line to do it at the manufacturing scale. Um, we advanced uh, integrated continuous manufacturing with uh, potent compound capability and controlled substance capability. And working with the DOD, we are implementing the first US multi product full C GMP uh, ICM factory. And we're anticipating that'll be ready in uh, early 2023. And uh, as far as our business plans, uh, we'll be able to manufacture and sell essential generic medicines as well as provide CDMO services for innovative drug companies. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I will ask that you save your questions uh, for the end. We'll answer them, I guess, all at the end. So thank you. Megan, I think you're on mute. I am. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to switch over to, <laughs> I warned you guys, that's what I do. Come in on mute. So we're going to switch over to Tom's presentation. Thank you, Stephen. That was great. I'm sure there will be plenty of questions coming up. Great. Thanks, Megan. And uh, hopefully at this point, you can see my slides and hear me. Um, so I, I really appreciate the opportunity, you know, to you know, again, uh, uh, share the stage with Stephen and, and talk about uh, continuous manufacturing. I'm going to switch gears a little bit to the biologic side, but you know, as this is a small and emerging field, uh, it, we find uh, that uh, often, uh, uh, you know, continuous conferences combine small and large molecule uh, talks because there are only so many of us, and uh, and I really enjoy uh, learning from you know our small molecule. Uh, colleagues, because uh, they're they're probably about uh, five to ten years ahead of us in the you know uh, conversion to continuous manufacturing. Um, and uh, so uh, let me let me just move ahead now with a, a couple of introductory slides. Uh, first on resilience, since we're a relatively new entrant to the biomanufacturing space, uh, 
realize a number of you may not have heard of us. Uh, the company was uh, really formed uh, a little over a year ago um, out of uh, some needs that uh, were identified by the pandemic, uh, you know, the first of which uh, uh, being a recognition of the uh, importance of uh, domestic supply chains that are, are critical uh, for health and economic security. And in fact, you know, you can see evidence of that uh, through uh, the government's investment in uh, continuous and the small molecule facility. Uh, and and uh, obviously the, the founders of Resilience uh, saw the same thing, wanted to establish uh, a company that was really focused on um, uh, investing in innovation uh, to in, in the manufacturing space for, for large molecules across many modalities. And part of that is the recognition that the ability to produce uh, complex medicines, particularly in the new modality areas, such as cell and gene therapy, where companies are uh, uh, also very active, has not really kept pace with the uh, ability to discover these medicines. And so um, we're in the process of building a, a robust uh, uh, network of uh, manufacturing capability and capacity uh, that is really um, uh, driven by um, you know, both uh, the ability to uh, manufacture with current technologies. Uh, so in the, in the biologics area, uh, the recombinant protein and monoclonal antibody area that, that I'm focused on. We have uh, significant fed batch capacity and much of the work we do is, is in fed batch, but also uh, we're investing heavily in what we believe are important future uh, technologies in manufacturing. And, and uh, oh, one of those areas is in the uh, digital space. Uh, we have a, a very strong digital team that's focused on you know, investing in digital capabilities to both improve um, communication with our, our manufacturing uh, clients and customers, as well as to improve our ability to uh, manage and analyze uh, data that we're generating, you know, across our manufacturing network. And, and another area of uh, uh, that's an example of our investment in, in new technologies is, is continuous manufacturing. Uh, and uh, we're in the process of um, investing in that, uh, you know, starting with a monoclonal antibody platform, but with an idea, eye, eye towards uh, the belief that uh, this is going to become a more important uh, approach to manufacturing across multiple uh, modalities. And our first uh, pilot plant in, uh, uh, for manufacturing uh, uh, biologics and monoclonals uh, uh, using continuous manufacturing is going to be right here in the Boston area. We're you know, building a, a non-GMP uh, continuous manufacturing a pilot plant in our Austin landing facility that's sized to be the appropriate scale for manufacturing toxin early clinical stage uh, supplies and also is designed with all GMP capable equipment and systems um, uh, with the idea that uh, once we establish you know the capability uh, and demonstrate the the performance of the platform we really can just press the uh, cut and paste button to start to uh, build uh, GMP capacity using uh, continuous manufacturing. Uh, so uh, I think uh, Stephen highlighted some of the important benefits uh, that we see for continuous uh, bioprocessing. Uh, obviously, cost is, is, is one of the uh, reasons to invest in, in this technology. Um, you know, continuous uh, across, uh, it's been shown in many process industries uh, to be, uh, or intensified uh, processing is a, a, a good approach to um, improve capital utilization. Um, and, uh, and so that's certainly one benefit, but we think there are uh, more important benefits as, as well, including ability to move more quickly, uh, which, which Stephen mentioned, uh, manufacturing flexibility uh, to the extent we can establish, uh, you know, uh, significant uh, capacity with smaller equipment and single use equipment gives us the ability to uh, improve our overall manufacturing flexibility. And, and you know, given our focus in uh, establishing a resilient, high-performing network of, of capacity. This is an important capability, we think, in the future. Um, also, uh, uh, improved control of product quality uh, we see as a potential benefit um, uh, for, for continuous manufacturing. And in fact, in the biologics area, uh, when we think about, you know, what, much of the experience we have in continuous is with uh, perfusion cell culture. And part of the reason for adopting perfusion cell culture processes historically has been to improve the control of uh, particularly labile uh, products that are made in uh, uh, bioreactor processes. And finally, scalability. Uh, continuous, I think, provides more options for scalability, not only scaling up, but scaling out and scaling with time or all options for continuous manufacturing. Uh, 
so on this journey, we're um, you know not the first, and and uh, you know we're certainly uh, standing on the shoulders of giants in in many ways. There's a lot of good work that's already been done in the biopharma field to demonstrate the feasibility of continuous manufacturing. Certainly, uh, large companies like Merck and uh, GSK and Bayer and others have contributed significantly in, in showing that this is possible, mostly in a pilot uh, uh, scale. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, other companies have, have already manufactured uh, products for clinical trials using continuous manufacturing. Uh, Biosana is a small uh, biosimilar company that was really one of the first uh, antibodies to enter the clinic uh, with a fully continuous uh, uh, process. Uh, there are others, particularly in the, you know, large company space, uh, uh, where companies have manufactured products that, uh, um, you know, using uh, uh, either uh, partially continuous or, or, or fully continuous processes. And of course, you know, small molecule, as I mentioned, uh, uh, there are already uh, several approved products where uh, part of the process is uh, operated in a continuous manner. Uh, and and uh, there are uh, in, in, industrial consortia that are also focused in this area, uh, including Nimble, uh, you know, BPOG and others uh, have, uh, you know, done work to both establish, um, you know, white papers, uh, you know, covering continuous manufacturing space, as well as uh, beginning to build uh, real lab uh, capabilities uh, to, to uh, you know, uh, act as sandboxes uh, for continuous manufacturing. And, and one of the, you know, values that we see in the pilot plant we're establishing is, is to serve as a sandbox to evaluate new technologies and approaches for continuous manufacturing. And finally, uh, regulatory interest in, uh, is, is evident in this area, as, as Stephen mentioned, uh, the FDA has expressed interest in continuous manufacturing. They have an emerging technology program that, you know, is, is helpful for companies that are investing in all kinds of new technologies, including uh, continuous. And there are uh, guidances that have been published and are emerging uh, in this area. And, and particular importance is a recently, you know, published uh, level two draft of the ICHQ 13 guidance for continuous uh, processing that, that covers uh, uh, biologics as well as small molecules. There's plenty of interest in the industry in this appro uh, approach to manufacturing, uh, even though it is relatively early, uh, very early days in terms of real adoption. So uh, the focus uh, for resilience really is, is to, to leverage the uh, capability and systems that already exist for continuous manufacturing uh, of biologics and to, to demonstrate the capability uh, uh, to do so in a, in a GMP manufacturing environment. In fact, to invest in you know, efficient, robust, and flexible GMP platforms for using um, you know, the existing technology for continuous production of antibodies so that, so that we can be a, a, manufacturer, a manufacturing partner of choice uh, in this area, as well as in the conventional fed batch area where we already have uh, significant capability and capacity. Uh, we also importantly want to do this in a really digitally enabled way. It's a part of our, uh, you know, mission to, to, to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, investing heavily in, in digital across the board. And, uh, you know, so from the beginning in, in this venture, we're committed to a paperless uh, solution uh, and, uh, you know, uh, workflows that will leverage the, the data, a uh, significant amount of data we're generating with continuous manufacturing. And finally, as I mentioned before, you know, the, we think we're, you know, very early on this journey of adopting continuous processes. So, you know, we want the, the pilot plant that we're building and the, the first generation platform we're building to be a starting point and a recognition that we're going to need to continue to evolve technology with, you know, uh, the rest of the industry, suppliers, collaborators, uh, you know, uh, to advance the, the field together uh, as we, you know, uh, really get better and better in, in, uh, in, in using continuous and intensified processes to, to make our products. Um, this, this slide just shows a very high level overview of, of the platform that we're building for continuous manufacturing. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's more pictorial than anything else, but one of the key points I want to make here is that there we're using all the same unit operations that we use in a FET batch process. Um, there, there's, you know, uh, you, you won't find any uh, novel unit operations here. We're really just converting these to uh, continuous or semi-continuous uh, mode of operation and interconnecting all of these so that we can run an end-to-end -end from the production bioreactor to 
really the bulk uh, drug substance, uh, you know, continuous process. And by doing so, it gives us the capability then to, you know, operate a, you know, process that is continuous in one or more unit operations. We don't need to operate every process in a fully end-to-end -end manner. Uh, many companies that are adopting these technologies are choosing to just link a few unit operations together or perhaps, uh, you know, combine the uh, perfusion uh, by reactor with a, uh, you know, multi-column capture step uh, as, as several uh, other companies have already demonstrated you know, it's feasible. Um, but we want to, you know, also enable the full end-to-end -end, uh, capability. So, you know, we're investing in that as a starting point with the idea that that will give us the technical uh, capacity and capability to really, you know, operate uh, continuously across the flow path. So, you know, from the production by reactor to protein A capture to low pH viral inactivation to the polishing section of the flow path, you know, it, it's all the conventional unit operations that you would find in that in that process. Importantly, we view this as a production line, not really as a, a sequence of batch unit operations. So we're thinking, we, we, you know, part of our journey is changing the mindset from a batch mindset to a production line mindset. And in order to operate this line, we really need two parallel lines. We need the logistics line of buffer and media prep uh, shown on top. And so we're spending a fair amount of time, you know, really thinking about how we efficiently manage liquids through this process. Uh, you know, because uh, to operate in this way, we, we need to move a lot of water through, uh, you know, through a smaller footprint. So uh, we're certainly spending uh, uh, time and effort thinking about how to efficiently do that. And on the bottom, I show the analytical, uh, you know, line because, you know, it, it does us no good to just uh, optimize uh, continuous manufacturing of a process if we are still taking the same batch approach to quality and, you know, uh, four to six uh, uh, weekly time for release testing, followed by a couple of weeks uh, for a QA release uh, of the batch. You know, it is you know uh, we're not we're not gaining the benefits of continuous if we don't really integrate uh, quality into our thinking of how we're going to operate in a production line mindset. So we're thinking very much about how we move analytics to the line, how we start to integrate you know quality uh, uh, quality attribute testing uh, during production as opposed to waiting uh, to the end of the batch. We'll, we'll we'll still be producing batches. We'll still be able to do conventional you know testing on on batches, but we also want to think about how do we bring quality to the line? And, and others in this field, uh, Amgen and Merck in particular, given some nice talks and published uh, nice papers on, on you know, strategies for doing that. So you know, we're, we're leveraging that thinking and, and, and trying to build on it as well. Uh, and uh, you know, at, at the bottom left of the slide sort of uh, highlights where we're heading. We're not anywhere near there right now, but eventually we'd like to be at a point where we can do uh, real-time or close to real-time release of, of drug substance using uh, continuous manufacturing. Uh, so importantly, as we, as we look at adopting this technology, we also have to have uh, process development approaches for continuous uh, manufacturing. And, and uh, you know, at least uh, our, our approach is to start with a platform process. We're fortunate to have, uh, you know, a large number of antibody products in our, uh, in our industry uh, and, and antibody-like products that uh, lend themselves to, to a platform process. And that allows us to invest in, you know, capabilities that can be applied to, to multiple uh, products. And, um, you know, uh, we also recognize that we're, you know, moving from a fed batch world and, and we need to, if, if this uh, approach to manufacturing is going to be successful, we need to demonstrate the ability to move, uh, you know, effectively from a fed batch process to a continuous process and possibly back again. You know, there are many reasons why you might want to consider adopting continuous manufacturing for, for clinical production and then, you know, potentially being able to use fed batch manufacturing for commercial production. And so part of our approach to development is ensuring that we understand the impact uh, and, and hopefully minimize the impact of product quality attributes from moving between uh, continuous and fed batch modes of operating. And so we're spending a lot of time developing both the process uh, development tools and the analytical uh, development methodologies to uh, allow us to ensure that we can manage product quality effectively as we as we work with customers to, to you know, manufacture their products uh, using intensified and continuous processes. Um, this slide really uh, shows um, uh, at a high level, you know, the, the potential benefits of uh, continuous manufacturing. Obviously, 
uh, you know, the, the reason for investing this is improved. Uh, one of them is improved volumetric productivity. Uh, so uh, these data um, or charts come from uh, data that we uh, uh, developed in our in our process development labs, where we took a, a fed batch antibody process. Uh, in, in this case, it was a uh, a process uh, that uh, you know gave a you know typical five gram per liter um, uh, titer over a fifteen day process, and we converted that into a, a continuous. Uh, cell culture process, uh, which we were able to relatively quickly move that to a continuous process uh, uh, operating at uh, uh, between one and two VVD uh, volumes per volume per day of media and uh, a productivity of two grams per liter per day. And and you can see on the right that even with a uh, with the uh, you know a ramp up time to steady state operation, uh, a 15 day operation, uh, a continuous at you know the lowest. Uh, um, you know, uh, cell, cell density that we're able to achieve. And in, in this particular case, the, uh, the cell densities are, uh, are relatively low. The specific productivity of the cell line was very high, uh, but, uh, you know, it shows that the uh, continuous mode of operation gave a, a significantly higher productivity of 15 days. And if you, you know, move that to a 30 day operation, uh, the productivity gains uh, uh, increase even more because you're minimizing the impact of the lower productivity uh, ramp up to steady state. Um, so as we move uh, to continuous, there are a lot of um, you know practical problems that we have to solve, and, and really a lot of our uh, focus is, is going to be how do we do this? How do how do we you know take uh, technology which really essentially proven, and 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 uh, you know develop really reliable approaches to to using it in a GMP environment? So you know uh, importantly, we have to be good at establishing process control strategies. Uh, with a continuous process. And, and uh, again, con consistent with our production line thinking, we're starting to look at state-based control instead of uh, sequential batch control. So, you know, for each of our unit operations, we want to understand, you know, how we're going to do the startup phase, how we're going to uh, operate at steady state, which is where we want to be operating for the vast ma uh, majority of our time in a continuous operation. And then what do we do when we have an out of range condition? How do we manage diversions uh, and, uh, and process upsets and deviations? Uh, uh, so, you know, that we're in an out of range state to bring us back to steady state. And then finally, how do we shut down at the end? Uh, so, you know, State-based control is 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 a, an area of thinking for us. Uh, managing upsets, of course. You know, are there differences? Uh, of course, there will be in 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 how we define NORs and AORs. You know, but you know, obviously, we're leveraging the same QBD approach to this that that we use in the Fed batch uh, process development. And then, importantly, you know, uh, what can we do now with online and outline testing, and and how can we start to build more capability in this area? Um, you know, uh, hopping to the bottom, one of the areas that we're really focusing on is microbiological monitoring and control. You know, for those who've been active in this area, you know, and, and, and for anybody thinking about this is, of course, uh, obvious that we're working with aqueous, uh, really growth promoting potentially solutions uh, in a continuous mode. We really have to be good at uh, microbiological control if we're going to be successful in, in producing biologics this way. So, Primarily closed systems, you know, having tools to give us uh, rapid uh, answers to microbiological monitoring questions, being able to to query biogram and endotoxin levels very quickly. Uh, those are all important aspects uh, of, of this approach, and and that kind of ties in with our thinking of on and at line testing, a subset of that. Um, how do we uh, define batches is a, a question where there's you know plenty of emerging guidance, and I'll show at the next slide an example of. One, one approach for a biologic process that way. And then how do we validate our processes? And, and there's been you know, plenty published on this and, and we hope to contribute to that moving forward as well. And I think there are many more issues that we'll come across as we, as we look at really practical implementation of this. And I'd love to hear input from, from those who are working in this area because you know, I always like to uh, be, uh, you know, engage in dialogue about things that we're not thinking of yet and could be. Um, so here's just an example of uh, one strategy for batch definition uh, for a, uh, uh, a cell culture uh, uh, antibody process uh, operating in continuous mode. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be uh, operating a production bioreactor that uh, moves through a growth phase into steady state, uh, hopefully fairly quickly. 
and uh, and then operate during a, a period of time. Uh, we're we're looking at for antibody production with the high productivities that we're looking at, not not the long conventional sixty or ninety day perfusion processes, but relatively short duration. Um, you know, uh, in some cases, people call this dynamic perfusion, uh, steady state operation of bioreactor, where we where we hopefully will be able to control product quality fairly tightly uh, over a maybe twenty or thirty day runtime. And uh, so during that time, that the bioreactor is operating in steady state. That's a, a bioreactor batch. We may choose to have one downstream batch cover that whole period of time, but we think it's more likely we're going to want to uh, have uh, sub batches on the downstream side. And you can see all of these unit operations are operating at the same time. So one of the benefits of continuous is we're pulling product off the line, you know, uh, very quickly. Uh, the, the, really, the uh, from the point we we start operating in steady state, and we may operate, uh, you know, for three to four days and and accumulate sufficient product uh, to um, to move to a bulk drug substance lab. And during this changeover, we do plan to have uh, final formulation and fill. Uh, you know, operating as a batch operation, which we uh, can do fairly quickly, uh, you know, given the scales we'll be operating at. And during this period, you know, we may integrate uh, operations in the, uh, you know, interval as, as part of our bio, bio burden control strategy. So in this case, we have uh, sublots, you know, 1-1, 1-2, that would come off of the, the single bioreactor batch. But you know, there are many ways of doing this, and ICHP-13 and the FDA's guidance, which is really focused on small molecules, both uh, highlight uh, some of the opportunities there as well as other obligations. Uh, so, you know, in, in all of this, uh, it's important to, to have a community. I, I think, you know, um, uh, when we started uh, uh, on this journey, you know, it sometimes get answers, well, aren't you worried about competition? And my answer is absolutely not. You know, there's no way we're going to do this alone. Uh, this is a, a journey where, you know, uh, we really gonna need a, uh, an industry to move in this direction for it to be meaningful and successful. And an important part of that is standards and, and standards and guidance documents, I think are critical to any emerging technology area. They help us define key terms, establish common frameworks and norms, they build a community, you know, they define expectations uh, with, from multiple stakeholders. And, and, and importantly, they allow suppliers and innovators who we rely on for equipment and supplies and you know, technology for continuous, they allow suppliers to invest with more confidence because they see an emerging, you know, uh, um, segment of the industry uh, with uh, with common norms and standards. Um, and, you know, a couple of examples we've already talked about in this area, ICHQ-13 and the FDA's uh, draft guidance on, on continuous, uh, but there, there are others as well, including the emerging technology uh, guidance from FDA, uh, even going back to the 2004, the PAT guidance, which is really uh, references continuous manufacturing well, well before its time, obviously, but it, you know, th that guidance is still very relevant. And then non-governmental organizations such as the USP and others are, are, are looking at establishing standards in this area. And, and finally, uh, there are academic, industrial, uh, and, and uh, governmental consortia such as uh, Nimble and BPOG and others that are uh, emerging, uh, doing important work in this area. So these all, I think, provide an important, you know, framework uh, to 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 operate within. So to wrap it up. Uh, just we think that adoption of intensified and continuous bioprocessing. Uh, is, is starting to increase in the industry. Uh, it's obviously early days and it holds the promise of providing significant benefits uh, across the board to manufacturers and, and uh, customers and patients. Um, there, there are many important topics related to practical application of continuous manufacturing uh, that, that are still emerging and that we need to build common consensus and approaches uh, for and uh, and well con conceived standards and guidance documents are certainly one tool for helping us do that. Um, I'd like to acknowledge some of my colleagues at Resilience who are working in this area uh, um, and, and really doing a, a, a lot of the day-to-day -day work uh, for us. Uh, Wan Chun Chui, who heads our development uh, group, uh, Andy Group, who is our cell culture lead, and Tom Erdenberger, who's uh, leading the effort to build our continuous pilot plant. And that uh, get to conclude and thank you for your attention and I guess we can move to the question and answer period. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, it was a great and rare look into both small and large molecule moving to continuous. Wonderful convert. Wonderful combination. So Aaron, my
partner with the EPC has some questions that came in. Aaron, would you like to? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank you, Megan. And also thank you, Tom and Stephen, for those really interesting uh, presentations. So uh, participants, uh, you can certainly um, come on camera uh, to ask your question. Uh, you can also type those into the chat. Uh, in the meantime, we did receive a, a good question from Keith Frisky. Um, regarding um, pre-sterilized single-use components. Keith, if you'd like to come on camera and ask that yourself, you can certainly do so. Uh, I'll give you a second or two to do that. Uh, but if I don't uh, see you come on camera, I'll go ahead and ask the question myself. So I'll give you a moment or two there. All right, I don't see Keith. Oh, there you are, Keith. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, yep, looking good, thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, this uh, a great presentation, Stephen, Tom. Uh, I was interested, Tom, in, in one of your slides regarding um, single-use pre-sterilized components and wanted to get a sense for uh, the timescales uh, of use of those components and are there any sort of top-of-mind type of components uh, that um, you could see some needs in terms of improvement on the durability or reliability of those uh, pre-sterilized single-use components to withstand those timescales. Yeah, that's a great question. So by timescales, I assume you mean like the length of operation uh, for, that we'll be using, yeah. So, um, and, and uh, yeah, that's something that we were certainly thinking about, you know, in the single-use area in general, um, most of our, certainly on the upstream side, you know, we have experience running uh, 14, even longer day bioreactor runs with single use uh, uh, bags. So, you know, extending that to 20 or 30 days is, is not too much of a leap. And, and, and there are groups that have, have done this, uh, you know, as I mentioned. So, um, but on the downstream side, uh, that, that's uh, an area where, you know, arguably, um, you know, our downstream, you know, uh, operational times are, are normally quite a bit shorter than that. And so now as we look to, to run, you know, 20 or 30 day processes with a, a, a single use uh, a bag or tubing set, we may uh, run into uh, failure modes that we haven't seen before. And, and, and that really is part of, you know, the, the, the types of practical challenges that we, we think we're going to be um, working to identify and address as we as we stand up this this capability, you know I, I think uh, we'll we'll have the same leachables and extractables assessment methodologies that we that we currently use, but you know the 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 risk scorings if you've done these you know uh, obviously the time will be a lot longer for many of these and so that may move uh, some types of components up in terms of how uh, how much we want to uh, study their. Um, leachable and extractable profiles uh, compared to the vendor packages that, that we normally rely on. Um, in terms of components that we, you know, might want to see, uh, and, and I should say, you know, some of our, you know, um, you know equipment we, we won't be able to get in, in pre-sterilized formats, uh, like uh, pre-packed columns uh, is one example where uh, there, there are some, uh, you know, uh, sterilized uh, column uh, technologies that are coming online, but, but in general, uh, you know, pre columns are available, you know, san sanitized, and we'll be sanitizing them and, and working to monitor bio burden. So we won't have a fully pre-sterilized flow path, but, you know, obviously if we can move to, you know, uh, uh, chromatography or membrane absorber products that are, that are sterilized, uh, that would be wonderful. You know, I, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're taking a belt and suspenders approach to microbiological control. The more we can control going in with everything being pre-sterilized and closed, the better. But we also need to recognize that we're still going to have open operations, still going to have some components that we're relying on, you know, conventional sanitization technologies to keep the bioburden down. And, and, and that will be part of our, you know, approach uh, for the foreseeable future, I'm sure. I don't know if that answers yes, they... your question. Yeah. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. Um, we've got another question uh, coming in regarding the economics of, uh, of continuous manufacturing. In particular, um, what, what would the impact be to patient populations and uh, drug availability and drug cost? Are we, are we seeing what those economic models look like? And if it does indeed have trickle down effect to, uh, to patients and payers? Um, so from the small molecule side of things, I can definitely see a reduction in costs, uh, manufacturing costs as far as um, how that translates to, you know, the cost of the patient. I would expect to, particularly if it's a generic drug, that it should be able to, I think that there's a significant economic competitiveness of being able to undercut your competitors and still be able to make a profit. So I see that as benefiting patients. Um, more importantly, I think that having plant-wide control of your entire manufacturing process and and the reduction in lead times, um, definitely, um, you know, the improvements in quality and the reduction in lead times, and I think how that impacts supply chain, I think that's going to benefit patients as well. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Stephen's comments there. And I just add on the biologic side, you know, I think even though biosimilars are starting to take hold, we don't really have, you know, our margins are generally pretty high across the board. So um, the, the pressure to reduce operating costs is not really at a level that it is in the small molecule field yet. You know, I, I, I've, I've looked at this, uh, you know, across, uh, you know, my career and, and, and I've asked the question, why would we expect uh, us to be in a different situation 20 years from now? I don't think there is a reason. I think eventually biosimilars will, will put us in a position where we really do care about operating costs and, and continuous will be an important approach to, uh, to driving down those operating costs. Um, uh, but for now, the main driver be economic benefit for continuous for biologics is reduction in capital. And, you know, talking to colleagues uh, across the industry where, you know, companies have invested in particularly late stage uh, continuous, it, a lot of it is instead of uh, spending a billion dollars to build my large scale manufacturing facility, I can spend $200 million. And that's a big capital savings, you know, that uh, is meaningful even when, you know, our operating costs are, are relatively low relative to sales price for most biologic products. All right, thank you. Um, we are coming up on one o'clock. So I'm going to ask uh, one last question. And uh, this one's coming from Jonathan Walker, and this is for you, Tom. So Jonathan would like to know, what is a realistic time frame for continuous biologics manufacturing to be used for clinical supplies and ultimately for commercial supply? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, one that uh, uh, my management asked me all the time as well. And I would say that, um, you know, I, I use the analogy uh, in, 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 in the talk I've given on innovation of single use. When you look at you know, single use technologies, which are arguably simpler than continuous, you know, they were introduced into the industry in 1999 with the wave bioreactor. And by 2014, we had our first approved biologic product that was made in a production, you know, single use bioreactor. So 15 years from introduction to, you know, first approved product. And, and now if you're building a 2KL facility, you know, uh, you, you, you probably wouldn't do it with anything but single use. So, you know, 20 plus years on, we're at the stage of uh, well accepted for small scale manufacturing, right? I think continuous is, is sort of a similar time frame. You know, people have been working on this for the last probably five to seven years, really in earnest when you go back to, you know, some of the early work at Merck and, and Bayer and others uh, and continuous, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, we're seeing our first clinical, you know, products being made there. Uh, maybe some, uh, some, some commercial products being made with partially integrated continuous processes. But in terms of full end-to-end -end, uh, continuous and, and real broad adoption, you know, I think I think we're looking at a, a, a two-decade time frame, roughly. And you know, so I think we'll start to see, you know, uh, it gain traction over the over the coming decade. And you know, hopefully, a decade from now or so, people will you know, uh, view it as a, uh, just a, 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 um, a normal option that you would consider for manufacturing any biologic product. But Thank you so much, Stephen and Tom for sharing your expertise with us today. And thank you everyone to joined in for the webinar.
Also, thank you for your support of the ISPE Boston's Educational Programming Chapter. You may have seen already a survey pop up in front of you. Again, if you could please fill that one out or the quick email one that is part of the follow-up. Thank you again to our dedicated sponsors, DPS, ICQ Consultants, and Massey Bioservices. On behalf of ISPE Boston and our presenters, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day.